Hi, my name is Ino Li, and in 2015, I came across this book, The Surrender Experiment. It is a book about waking up, about enlightening, about seeing the world and seeing ourselves in a profoundly different way. In 2022, in July, I had the chance, finally, of meeting the author himself, Michael Singer. Um, tell me a bit more about what does it mean to abandon reason? Because you were a pretty reasonable economic student. Yeah. <laughs> it's very liberating or empowering, actually, to because you have answered this question last night. The lady asked, like, I've been storing this in for 50 plus years. Does it take me 50 plus years to yeah. release it, let it go? So it says, thank you for an amazing story. We're here joining you to surrender in the flow, to the flow of life. Oh, <laughs> wow, that's just beautiful. <laughs> um, how does this help us to be better parents? If, if I have a newborn baby in front of me, okay? Does he or she have to go through the same process of building you know, layers and layers of blockage, blockages? If you are curious about these questions too, um, I hope you enjoy the interview to come. Um, yeah, so Michael, it's wonderful to finally meet you. Um, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, maybe if you don't mind, maybe say hi to the, to the, to the viewers. You know, they, they know how your voice sounds like. Right. Hi. <laughs> it's an honor to be with you all. I really look forward to talking to Inu and sharing it all with you. <laughs> Great. Um, so it's it's really in a way a kind of a miracle experience for myself, a miraculous, I would say, because as you know, I got to know your name through through this book, actually, the Surrender Experiment. That's the first one I read. And actually um, in this book, on page 44, there's a picture of the first hut <laughs> you built. Um, and it was amazing. Yesterday when I was walking around there, I was like, wow. Because I knew this existed for now 45 years or 40, 50. 50 years. 1971. Yeah, that's right. It's when it's finished. Um, but still seeing that in person, it's have this sense of this being surreal. <laughs> so, so really, you know, I think it's in a way, when I first read it, I have no idea we have a chance to really talk to you in person and for you to share with us your experience over the years. Um, so I start with this quote in this, chap in this book because the, the one that really touched me the most is when you were building this hut. You said, we jumped right in with the abandonment of reason that belongs only to the young hippies and crazy people. It was an amazing experience. I had very little money left to build uh, Bobby Altman's chalet, uh, chalet, or <laughs> chalet, to keep costs to a minimum, both Bobs agreed that we could use rough sawn lumber instead of the finished lumber you buy at lumber yard. Um, as fate would have it, you talk about the couple. There was a sawmill just a few miles down the highway from the land, Griffiths Lumber and Sawmill. And you talk about their, the couple, James and his wife, a real Southern folk, lo no long hairs. <laughs> and then you talked about them, and then you, you keep on doing, and then you talked about the first time they actually opened, began to open up to you and invite you for dinner. Yes. Um, and then that's, I think you, 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 you said something around, this is the first time in six months you have eaten under a roof. <laughs> so yeah, so that's really what touched me because when you're saying abandonment of reason that belonged only to the young hippies and crazy people, um, tell me a bit more about what does it mean to abandon reason? Because you were a pretty reasonable economic student. Yeah, I was getting my doctorate in economics at the <laughs> university. Yeah. And I had a deep experience uh, in meditation, almost the first time I meditated. And it woke me up. It woke me up to realize that it's not just about the intellect of the mind and what the mind can understand, that there's something much deeper inside. And it touched me very, very deeply. In fact, it's never stopped. I touched a guy in my whole life, right? All it takes is a minute of touching something higher than where you've been. Yeah. And you realize, oh, there's something going on more than what I thought. Yeah. Right. So then we end up in a situation where what I wanted to do was take some time off to meditate, to be alone and, and explore this. So when we went to build this, it was supposed to be a hut, it ended up being a beautiful house. When we went to build this hut, it was what I had to do. Is that, uh, my friend had graduated from a master's degree in architecture. And he decided that a hut was something you build balsa with models of and have solid glass fronts and all. Oh my God. And none, <laughs> it's a none, palace. None of us had ever built anything. And so basically the abandonment that only belongs to young hippies and crazy people is if you want something and there's anything in your way, you don't mess around. So I wanted to be alone in that house to meditate 
And this was what had to happen in order for that to happen. <clears throat> and therefore, it had nothing to do with reason, had nothing to do with logic, had nothing to do with can I, can't I, how are we going to do this? It was just throw yourself into it and figure out how to do it because I want to get to the other side. I, I'm very focused on the one point in this. And therefore, it all falls away, all the the doubts and the this and the that. You know, it's like if you really love somebody and you can't, they're away, but you want to see them, right? And you just, you go through any obstacles, you go through anything. Yeah. That's what it was like for me to get that time alone yeah. and explore what I had touched. Yeah. But for, for most people, they would have thought this is a distraction, right? Because it's a big project. It took much longer than you have imagined. Um, what, I, you actually went to a lot of depth into that conversation, but like around that time, or maybe there are many times later in your life, because you've built, thank you for showing me the, 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 the land. And there, I just can't imagine over 50 years, how much work was there. Um, I'm, I'm sure most of them were not planned. Like, had that conversation happened to you? This is a distraction. Well, this project is so much bigger than I have thought. I had no choice. That's what I found in my entire life is I can fight with things or I can work them through. If I fight with them, it takes just as much time, creates all the confusion, and it doesn't get done because <laughs> you're busy fighting, right? right? So it became, if you're very goal-oriented, right, and, and you know where you want to go, then you work with what's in your way, not in your way, which comes into your way yep. so that you can go to that place. Well, this is what was happening. I, I had a couple of friends of mine. I couldn't build it by myself, even a little hut, right? <laughs> and so here were two friends that were willing to pitch tents. Yeah. And they had never built anything either, right? Pitch <laughs> tents, and we would do it. And this, this my friend, Robbie Allman, who had graduated arch, uh, Master's in Architecture, he was very positive. He became a very famous architect worldwide, by the way. All right. And he was just out of college. There was nothing that he couldn't do. He felt I can do anything, get out of my way, very creative. And so that was the energy I ended up with. Yeah. It's not what I wanted, but that's <laughs> what was there. And so he designed this thing. What did I know? And so we built it. We yeah. built it. And it only took three months. We built that entire thing in three months. There's the three of us. Yeah, and then for somebody who has never built it, built anything, anything, right? Yeah. yeah, and then I, as I shared with you, the, the reason this is really touching <clears> to me was when I read it, I was we were starting our own school. It's exactly the same feeling, but because there are so much voices in my mind right now, um, which I'm curious to hear about yours, is that people would say, "How? Hey, what do you know about building a school? Like, do you have an education degree? Have you run school before? Were you a teacher?" Like none of it. I was none of it. That's why, you know, when I was building it, I was like, there's always a voice in my mind. Oh, I'm crazy. Like I'm doing something that's wrong. I'm going to be a gigantic failure. Like, you know, people would look at you, laugh at you and all that. And that's why when I read this thing, it was so inspiring to me. I was like, wow, they built it. You're still standing after 50 years. <laughs> but I think those voices are, I mean, you talked about actually in all three books about the preferences and things you like, the, how your how mind works. Um, I think it's pretty common. Yeah. Have you had those voices and how did you deal with those voices? Well, and I explained in the beginning of the surrender experiment, yeah. <clears throat> that's how I started my spiritual journey is I was sitting on a couch with a friend of mine back in, who knows, 69, 70 maybe. And uh, there was a lull in the conversation. And somehow that's not comfortable, even with friends. You know, that you were talking and then there's nothing to say. And you try to think of things to say to keep, keep the conversation keep going. the conversation about going. feeling comfortable. Yeah. It's really about control. Right. That you have a certain amount of control that you know this person is interacting with you. They're okay. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. All right. Yeah. And so I noticed that that was going on inside my head, that he was anxious, even with a friend. All right. That, that there was this sense of discomfort in the silence. Yeah. And Mickey, Michael, was trying to think what to say. Mm. Now, I, I, to this day, that was 52 years ago, I remember the whole exact moment where it is. And he's sitting there saying, uh, it's kind of hot out, isn't it? Or <laughs> would you like to have something to eat? Maybe we can get a pizza. Jesse he kept saying these things. Yeah. And inside, I noticed that that's going on in my mind. They all seem very stupid to say. And I didn't say them. For the first time in my life, I didn't go along with that neurosis, with what the mind was saying. And then I realized, uh, who am I 
that is noticing the mind saying that. And as simple and silly as that seems, that guided the rest of my life, period. That moment mm. woke me up to realize, wait a minute, it's always talking, right? It's not yeah. always trying to figure out whether to eat or something. It's always saying something. It's yeah. busy judging and thinking and liking and not liking and figuring out what to do. Yeah. But now I'm not it. I'm yeah. watching it do that, yeah. right? I was awakening to witness consciousness. But right. I had no background. Yeah. I'd never met anybody. I didn't yeah. meditate. You didn't go to yoga, there, and there was gurus. nothing, yeah. nothing. Yeah. It just happened, okay? Yeah. And I'm watching it, and I started to feel I don't want to be that. I don't want to be like that, Yeah. right? Yeah. And so I remember the first thing I said, instead of, do you want to do this? Should we do this? So I'm watching this voice inside my head telling me what to say, but I'm feeling distant from it for the first time in my life. And so instead of saying, when I finally talked, <clears throat> I didn't say, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Isn't it hot? You know, do you remember what Nixon did the other day <laughs> or something? I sat there and said, I have this voice inside of my head talking. Do you have one? And as I said to him, and he was a famous lawyer. He was my brother-in-law at the time. And he was a big lawyer in Chicago and had never thought about these kind of things. And basically, he looked at me and he looked at me strange with this kind of look. And then all of a sudden, bam, this light went on in his eyes. It was so beautiful. A light went on. He said, yeah, I know just what you're talking about. Mine, mine never shuts up. And there it was. That was, and the rest. Of all my years, I mean, I mean, it stops, so I don't have to work with it as much, <clears throat> but everything was about that voice. Yeah. All right? So you're talking about how yours was telling you you can't do this. My whole thing from that moment forward was, wait a minute, I don't need this junk going inside my head. Yeah. It's so distracting. It's so negative. It tends yeah. to be negative, yeah. right? Yeah. Most of the and time. And so on. <laughs> so by the time I was building the house, I had started to work with that voice. Mm. And this, I started working with it, but telling him to shut up. <laughs> I said, like, shut up, shut up. I don't want to talk to you. Right? <laughs> then you realize that's the voice telling the voice to shut up. Yeah. It took, it took quite a while for me to wake up to realize how to work with that. Right. But at that time, I was not listening to it. If yeah. it said, you can't build that house, I said, shut, shut up. Shut up. <laughs> Which is not the right way. Do not do Suppress that. Suppress it. That is not the right way to deal with that voice in your head. All right? But so it wasn't a problem because I wasn't listening to it. Yeah. So I was yeah. just letting this unfold as yeah. it was happening. Yeah. And putting my whole heart and soul into this is what I need to do to get to where I want to go. Right. So I'm going to do it. Yeah. And there was no complaining, no this, no that. Yeah. So there's yeah. the answer. One thing, actually, it's on a, from this book, of course, then I know it, this is your second book. And you actually had your first book out. <clears throat> and then the first book out actually came out in 2007. And I remember, this is, this is my note from the first time I read it. You kind of talked about it. This is actually on the first page of introduction. You say that, um, so that Freud, the father of psychology, divided the psyche into three parts, the lid, the ego, the superego. He saw the lid as our primal animal nature and the superego as the judgment system that society has installed within us. Um, blah, blah, blah. You talk about that. And then basically you said, um, after all, on which of these conflicting forces are we to be true? Right? I think the voices you talked about are just basically different levels of ourselves. You actually go deeper and deeper into the true self later. Yeah, I wouldn't call I, I don't call that a layer of myself. Self. Like uh -huh. if you're looking at your car, mm -hmm. you don't say that's a part of myself. myself. Right? So I, I, I don't, don't do that. No, okay. I do not identify at all with, with what I'm looking, looking at. at. I'm the one who's looking. Right? And from the moment I woke up, it was that. Yeah. Right? This is something I'm looking at. I see what Freud means by the id, yes. right? That the body has drives yes. and urges and problems and so on. <clears throat> and I once defined the id as the body's representative in the mind. Yeah. It talks. I want this. I'm hungry. I need this. Right? Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. And that the superego is society's representative in the mind. Yeah. You shouldn't have done that. You know that's not right. Yeah. You should be guilty. You should, right? And that the ego is what tries to bring a balance in the mind, a self-concept of, okay, I can't do this, I can't, I should do this, here's who I am, and it defines yourself. But even in psychology, it calls it a self-concept. A concept is not a real Yourself. thing. Yeah. A concept is not a real thing, a concept is a self. You have any concept what an apple tastes like? And you should answer me and say, I don't have a concept, I tasted the darn thing, right? <laughs> or no, I have no concept. 
or I think it tastes like a chicken. <laughs> you can any concept you want, you make anything up. But yeah. the concept is not real. Yeah. So when psychology says ego is your self-concept, it's something you make up in your mind to be comfortable and present that face to the world as mm -hmm. your mask mm -hmm. that you put on in front of the world. Mm -hmm. When I woke up, I was noticing that going on. It was doing everything Freud said, mm -hmm. but I wasn't it. Mm. So I don't want to call that a part of myself. Mm -hmm. This is myself, mm -hmm. the one that watches. Mm -hmm. You always follow me? Mm -hmm. All right. So these, yes. these are aspects of the mind, right? There's aspects of the body, aspects of the world unfolding in front of me. Yeah. Who sees them? Yeah. Who is in here noticing this stuff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I it, it, I get it. I think that's what you call the self the, with the big with the capital S. You can right. That's the that's that's the true self. But the reason I I talked about it was because I think exactly because people are confused. Like who am I? I think you in the third book uh, you you have a very interesting and actually very simple analogy, which is not analogy but basically description of your experience. Like when you're watching the mirror. Um, and you see yourself, you see your image, like I'm a 40-year-old woman, right? So like, I think you have an interesting quote, say, what if today my body becomes a man? Mm. Am I still me? <laughs> like, and my body changes or I age and things change, my hair is different. My... So it's that person who's watching, who, who was there since you were born, mm. um, but you kind of notice it. But I think that the lot of suffering that comes from basically a confusion of that to um, a lot of layers in front of us. Like you'd say, maybe, the, you know, if I am somebody who owns a car, right. is that part of me? Right. I own this house, is it part of me? It's part of your self-concept. Right, right, exactly. I have this job, is it part of me? That's I have this memory of my experience, right. is it part of me? That's so right. what is me? What, it, what, what am I? As you talked about last night, this is the question like people have been asking all this time. But I guess what you're saying is that, that none of them is you. No, you're it's, the one who notices. Notice that, exactly. Right. And then that's basically what consciousness means, right? A, is a, that Awareness of being. Yes. <laughs> you're aware, right? Yeah. It's like, I, I, I sometimes tell the story about the car, right? Yes. So you go to a dealership, you don't have a car, Yeah. right? People are sitting on a car, they're trying different cars, they're sitting in the car, right? You go there to the dealer and you sign a piece of paper. Suddenly. And get off my car. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God, just like that. <laughs> it became part of your self-concept. Right. It's, it wasn't you before. How did it become you? Yeah. You signed a piece of paper. You gave him some money. Give me a break. <laughs> All right. That, that is you projecting your sense of self yes. onto something that is not yourself. Yeah. Okay. Right. So let, let's say you had an experience in the past. You say, well, I'm the person that did this or did that. Right? Yeah. Well, what if you hadn't done that? Something else had happened. Yeah. Would you still be you? Would you still be in there? Would there still be consciousness of awareness? Yeah. You eventually settle back to realize I am the indwelling consciousness that is aware of my thoughts, aware of my emotions, and aware of the world unfolding in front of me. And I'm very aware that the mind, uh, that I, rather, I did it, okay? <laughs> I built a concept of myself in the mind in order to create stability, mm -hmm. in order to say, I am this, I am that, I'm the person that this happened to, I'm the person that got married, but 10 years ago I got divorced, right? And so I've developed this concept of myself so that I can present that to other people. Yeah. But that's not who I am. Yeah. Right? Not only to present to other people, and you become almost imprisoned. Yeah, you are imprisoned. In that concept, right. because once that concept is broken, it's like, okay, my life is shattered. That's right. Actually, no, <laughs> it's the concept is shattered. But that's the, that's so common thread in many, like, I guess, common people's life. I know one of the things I was very curious when you talk about your enlightenment, like that moment when you have that voice. And that's, I would say, when you were 23, 24, maybe? 22. 22, 22, 22. 22. Right. Yeah. yeah. So now it's like 50 years later. Yeah. Would you, I think this is something probably people have questions because you are much older <laughs> compared to, you know, many, many of your readers. And one of the biggest fear is, aging is dying like is how life is when i you know reach 70 or 80 years old um so if you look inward from your 22 years old until now um you said you never returned but like has has your uh, consciousness or awakening evolved since course, that point absolutely what's the nature of that my, re my relationship with myself and with my mind and with the source of consciousness, which we can talk about later, all right? Yeah. <clears throat> like everything has a source. Yes. So yes, I'm conscious. Where did it come from? 
Where did consciousness come from? I know where the body came from. Darwinian evolution, we can do all that kind of stuff. I sure as heck know where the mind came from. I've watched it for 50 years, <laughs> right? It's you take the pieces of the world and you glue them together and you say, this is who I am, right? Learned, you said it's learned experiences. That's or, right. Yes. The sum of your learned sum experiences. Sum of the learned experiences. That's what your mind is, yes. right? So I've, I've worked in there for 50 years watching this thing, right? So yes. all, but who am I? What is this consciousness? What's its nature? Where mm -hmm. did it come from? How did I get in here? Mm -hmm. Right? I've mm -hmm. been in here all the time. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, there's no question. I, I, when I was 10 years old, I looked in the mirror. I didn't see what I see now, a 75 <laughs> year old body. I saw a 10 year old body, but it was me that saw it. Sorry. I can tell you right now. All yeah. right. <laughs> when I go to sleep, there's a really good one that I like to use. When you go to sleep, you dream, right? Yes. You wake up in the morning. And you say, I had this amazing, amazing dream, dream last night. How do you know? Just be so far. How do you know you had that dream? You weren't there. I came in, I talked to you. You didn't move. I touched your body. You didn't do a single thing, right? You weren't there. So what do you mean I had this dream? And why did you say I had the dream, right? And then in the dream, you said, when in the dream, I was seeing this and I got married. You're using the same I. Oh, my God. He's the same I that I was the one in the dream getting married. I was in the dream flying. I was in the dream died, right? And then you wake up, you say, I had this dream. Because it is the same you. It is the same consciousness that experienced the dream, that is experiencing your thoughts, your waking thoughts. It, like People need to look at this, all right? Our words that we use in our everyday language really do reveal the truth. I'm having <laughs> trouble with my mind. Well, my is a possessive pronoun, right? It means you own, own. something. Yeah. Who owns it? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So it's just, it's really beautiful, isn't it? Okay? <laughs> Absolutely. And so, so you, you, over time, you just get further and further back. Mm -hmm. It's not, you still interact in the world. I got married. I have children. I have a child, I have grandchildren, right? I had a business, a billion dollar, mil, you know, billion dollar business, yeah. all this kind of stuff, right? But this is back here. Yeah. watching that go on yeah. and participating, right? But anytime you want, you just pull back and you realize, I'm always fine, yeah. right? Whether good things are going on or bad things are going on, has nothing to do with me. I'm the awareness that's aware that my emotions are not doing well right now. I'm the awareness that's aware that my emotions are doing wonderful right now. Mm. I'm just the light of consciousness, they call it. Yeah. The awareness that is shining on the object Right, so that's what has happened over these fifty years. Mm. Is you settle further and further back into what's called the seat of self, into the sense of being, mm -hmm. and then of course this all changes because why is the mind so noisy? Why does it talk so much? I learned a lot about mind by watching it for fifty years. Right, mm -hmm. it's because when things happen that you like, everything feels good inside. When things happen that you don't like, everything feels terrible inside. Of course, you prefer that it feel good than feel bad. So what the mind does is try to put together through experiences, through concepts and views, what it is that the world needs to do for me to be okay. Mm -hmm. What it needs to not do so I'm not worse, mm -hmm. all right? And that's what you watch the mind doing. Mm -hmm. What do I need to do? What do I need to say? What do I need to wear? How, did I hurt somebody? How do I fix that? It's just always, how do I get the outside world to unfold or be in a way that I'm comfortable inside and not uncomfortable. And the more comfortable, the better, by the way. Yeah. All right. And so the mind just keeps talking about that. Yeah. Because you told it to. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so what happens is as you pull back naturally, I like to be a natural thing, not fighting. As you notice, why am I paying some attention to this mind? Right. Who am I? Then what happens? You start to feel there's a joy inside. There's a very natural joy inside where you're just spontaneously happy. Mm -hmm. You're spontaneous. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Then yeah. you don't, the mind by itself shuts up because yeah. it doesn't have to think how to be okay. Yeah. You understand that? Yeah. You, let's say you say something to somebody and they take it the wrong way. They get insulted. You look inside and say, did I mean to insult them? No, I love them. I like them. They just took it the wrong way, right? 
okay, that happens. Mm -hmm. And you're okay with it. Mm -hmm. You're at peace with it. You don't have to go calling and fixing and doing all that kind of junk, <laughs> right? And a lot of times you find out they didn't even take it the way you thought, thought they you did. did. And so you're just making a mess, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, it all becomes very quiet and very simple. Yeah. You still do your work. You still bring up your family. You do whatever you need to do, whatever's yeah. in front of you. Yeah. But you do it out of love. You do it out of peace. You do it out of a sense of, isn't this wonderful, this interaction with life. Yeah. I don't have to make it be a certain way. Yeah. I can enjoy the unfolding and interacting with it however it is. Yeah. That's what happens over time. Over time. That's called maturing. All right. And you're maturing. You're, yeah. e you're evolving. And you're, the real evolution is your relationship with yourself. Right. Are you getting along with yourself? Can can this consciousness be at peace with the fact that sometimes the heart hurts and sometimes the mind gets disturbed? But it doesn't stay that way. Can you be at peace or do you have to make that the whole purpose of your life to make sure that no one ever says that again? Or <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, is it a very gradual process or are, are there milestones? It, 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 it is both. It is everything. And mm. it is different for everyone. There's mm. your answer. So I don't want somebody building a concept yes. that they have to have an awakening like I did. Okay. Yeah. Or that it takes as many years or something like that. What happens is, <clears throat> and, and you know that, all the books stress that, we have had experiences in our lives that have not been comfortable. All of us have. Different experiences for each of us, yep. but we're not comfortable. Yep. What do we do with that? We discussed this last night. What do we do with it when it's uncomfortable inside? We protect ourselves by pushing it away. Push it away. Don't, no, no. No, suppress bad, it. bad dog, get away <laughs> from dog. me, all right? And you suppress it, and you repress it, and you resist it. It gets stored inside. That's one of the great revelations I had as I grew, right? Which is, oh my goodness, everything that I am not accepting, that I'm resisting, can't pass through me, mm -hmm. right? It's on its way through the universe, like mm -hmm. that Beatles song, right? It's, it's <laughs> across the universe, right? It, everything that happens is just passing through time and space, but it didn't pass through me. <laughs> Why? Because I said, no, I don't want to feel this. So I resisted it and it got stored inside. Yeah. The, all that stuff that's stored in there is blocking your natural energy flow. Yes. Like you all talk about chi. Yes. Right? Tai Chi and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. There really is an energy and, and, and acupuncture and so on, right? I mean, the Chinese culture, they, they gifted us with all of that yes. knowledge and so on. Yeah. There is an energy flow inside, but not if it's blocked. Mm hmm. So if you, and the question, how does it get blocked? Because you blocked it. You <laughs> shove this stuff down there on top of your energy flow. Yeah. That's the most important thing to understand. Yeah. Everybody has a beautiful energy flow. Yeah. Everybody has tremendous love and joy and bliss and nirvana and ecstasy going on inside themselves right now. Mm -hmm. That is the natural state of a human being. Mm -hmm. But you have shoved a cloud in front of the sun. Mm -hmm. The sun's still it. shining. The sun <laughs> shines. It's been shining for 4.5 billion years. Yes. Exactly. It doesn't go to sleep at night. It, that's not true. <laughs> all right. It just sits out there and shines. But you block it by shoving this stuff down there. Mm -hmm. And so now you don't feel the energy flow. And you have to compensate for that by trying to get it from outside. By somebody saying, oh, you're beautiful and you're so special and I love you so much and blah, 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 blah. Oh, and you're the best worker I ever had and I want to give you a raise, right? And you get the corner <laughs> office next time. You understand that? Then all of a sudden, it causes an openness inside mm -hmm. and you can feel some of the energy, mm -hmm. all right? Everything mm -hmm. you feel, love, all this stuff, is that energy opening up. Yeah. But it's conditional. Things have to be exactly like right outside to match the junk you stored inside <laughs> to feel safer and so on so that you open, right? Yeah. So what spirituality and what all my years are about, what spirituality is about is saying, wait a minute, why am I blocking my own energy flow and then having to go out there and beg people to be the way I need them to be so I can feel myself? Love is inside. Joy is inside. Everything you feel is inside. Why do I need somebody or something or the boss or some you know, winning to make me feel what I feel inside of me. And you catch on why, because you blocked all this stuff. And so eventually, and that's what I spent my life doing. You get to the point saying, well, I don't want to do that. That doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. Mm -hmm. The cost benefit analysis doesn't work, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. I kept, uh, so somebody says something that bothered me. Okay, be bothered and then let go. Mm -hmm. Don't store it. Mm -hmm. Just say, okay, fine. It was uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It was uncomfortable. Yeah. Follow me? So you give it some space, but you let it go. 
you commit yourself that I'm not storing more stuff in here. Yeah. And then what happens is as you let go of new stuff, as you don't store new stuff in, the old stuff starts to come up by itself. Because mm. it, in, in business, we talk about a LIFO stack and a FIFO stack. Ever heard those terms? Last in, first out, or first, first in, uh, last. Yeah, that's okay? Right, yeah. All right? Yes. So this is a last in, first out. out. <laughs> okay? When you shove what bothers you today down there, Clear that's it. what comes up in your dreams. Yes. But you have all that other stuff down there that yeah. can't come up yeah. because you put stuff on top of it. Yeah. Follow yeah. me? Yes. So as you let go during your life, that's why I say you said, does it happen suddenly? Does it happen gradually? Does it take a long time? That's up to you. Right? If somebody says something and it hits something that your father used to say and all this stuff comes up inside, do you therefore push it away again and don't let it up? Or do you say, okay, it's time to let this go? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I don't, and, and that's what determines how fast you grow. Right. How willing you are to release. Yeah. It's very liberating or empowering, actually, to because you have answered this question last night. The lady asked, like, I've been storing this in for 50 plus years. Does it take me fifty plus years to right. to um, to um, and you know and uh, it release it, let it go? And I think your answer was brilliant. Do you mind sharing the answer you had? You thought you have this analogy of a dripping water, right? Okay. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> I I talked about. I like, listened. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't. Well, so, let's say you had an eyedropper, and every day for whatever reason you keep dropping this eyedropper into the bowl, and it keeps filling up. And it's a problem. 50 right? years. But it takes years and years and years, yes. and you keep filling this bowl. And now you have this weight and this problem and a water problem and so on. Right? How long does it take to empty that bowl? One second. <laughs> if you're willing to, you just turn it upside down, and all that you put in there is gone. gone. Yeah. Right? If you're willing to, and people don't believe this, they don't understand. Yeah. Even very intense experiences that were difficult to go through. Yeah. We all go through different things, right? If you decide, I don't want this in here running my life, mm -hmm. right? It's not going to go away in a minute, okay? Yeah. But you change your whole attitude about it. Yeah. Not, I am the person that this terrible thing happened to, right? Somebody yeah. died or this happened or that happened or a war. Who knows, right? Yeah. What kinds of thing goes on. and and it, But it's not happening now. It's over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I've defined myself as the person that went through this terrible experience and I'll never be okay. No, no. no. Yeah, I know it's terrible. It is terrible. Experiences are terrible, but it's more terrible to carry them throughout your entire life when they're over. <laughs> if something's over, it should be over. Yeah, right. And so yeah. you commit yourself to saying, "I don't want this stuff inside here blocking my joy, yeah. blocking my love." Yeah. All right. And so you you start you work with it. You don't rip it out. It's not going to go away in a minute, but it'll come up at different times. It comes up naturally. Somebody says something, somebody reminds you of it, you think something, and all of a sudden the heart gets this way. Just stop, relax, and say, this is my opportunity to let a little peace go. I'm willing to experience some pain, some disturbance, so I don't have to carry it for the rest mm -hmm. of my life. Mm -hmm. That's Now, how much you're willing to do that, that's your spiritual growth. Yeah. That's yeah, the I think that's. Of it. And that's why that's why you call it untethered because it's basically the tether, that's right. right? It's the pull. Um, and in the in the in the rec the most recent book you had, which is a um, wonderful reading, I think all your reading is there. Yeah, maybe let me talk about this for now because it was interesting. You talked about you actually also went to different masters, gurus, but what made your book so accessible is that you never use jargons, and then it's a it's very much a direct experience and you use very much day-to-day -day analogies like people can just you know like the bowl of water or the tether like you know like it's very easy for people to understand um do you think people have to go through that you know do i have to go to india i never went to india <laughs> <laughs> So, do answer. I have to go find a guru? Like, no, do I have no, to find? But so, like, no. because that's that's a kind of a common mystical. Like, you know, you've done that because you say no now because you've done it. I didn't do it. It happened <laughs> to me. I never. It. I didn't do it. I'm serious. Yeah. Right? So the different people, high beings or master, they came here. They want to give a talk. Uh, they invited me. So I, I didn't ever seek, seek it. it mm. Okay. It things happen and they caused some awakening or brought some stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But my my experience, like my guru, I have a guru. Yogananda is my guru. I've never met him, right? He died way before <laughs> I was five years old or something, right? <laughs> and and I don't do anything to to 
stay in a particular place that he was or anything like that, right? It's just an understanding that I can't do this myself, okay? And so that something woke me up, all right? I don't know why I woke up with that. These experiences are unfolding throughout my life, the surrender experiment. They're very good for my growth. Yeah. So I sit there and say, I'm not doing it, okay? And I just attribute it to a, a, a higher force, Yeah. okay? All right, yeah. and I give the force a name. <laughs> okay, but I, I've never met him. I never did. So it's not like that. So you, you ask, mm. what does a person need to do to achieve total happiness all the time, to feel complete love, to bring love into this world? They need to let go of the stuff that they've stored inside that's blocking their energy, and they need to not put any more in, right? in the opposite, opposite order. They need to not put more in on their day-to-day -day experience, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then they'll learn how to let go of the bigger stuff right? And it all will happen. Mm -hmm. It all unfolds that way. Mm -hmm. And whatever, you know, whatever you need will unfold. It's there. But you have to be willing to cleanse, to let go of this garbage that you stored inside. And then you'll find out you're fine. You're filled with love. And, you know, people will come to you and say, help me or something. You, you didn't do anything. Yeah. Right? It's just yeah. naturally, the books came out, all this. It just naturally unfolds when you stop devoting your life to your stuff. Yeah. It's not even like you devote your life to yourself. You devote your life to the worst part of yourself, <laughs> to the part that's all blocked. I'm not okay. I need to find somebody. I need to do something. I'm not happy with my job. And if people to criticize me and I don't want to be yeah. here anymore, that's the lowest part of your being. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so and we just, devote our energy to you it. devote your energy to that. <laughs> so of course you're not okay. I, it, my, I'm one of the, the great realizations I had, which seems so silly, so obvious, is if you're going to store everything that ever bothered you inside of you, you're going to be bothered. <laughs> it, right or wrong. Right. Right? That's yeah. what you've done. You took all these experiences that you didn't like, you suppressed in them, there. and then you wondered, I wonder why I'm not happy. <laughs> I wonder why I don't feel loved. I wonder why I can't get anything that, that, that I want in life. Because you stored everything that ever bothered you inside of you, and as long as you did that, when you look inside, it's going to be bothered. Yeah. And so another quote from the new book that I really like, and Oprah said it was her favorite quote, which is, the moment in front of you is not bothering you. You're bothering yourself Self about the moment in front of you. Yes. And you look at that, and they, this is a line, and you study that, right? And you realize, well, that, that's true, right? Yeah. Somebody said something, then they walked away. They criticized me, my work. I, you know, boss came by, criticized the work. Okay, and then they walked away, okay? That can't bother you unless you bother yourself Allow about it. Allow it to happen, yeah. No, it yes. happened, but you're bothering yourself. yourself about the fact that it happened. happened. So you're the person that's in charge, you understand that? You can sit there and say, fine, maybe I need to look at my work. Maybe there was some relative, maybe he had a bad day or a fight with his wife. You can do anything you want once it comes in there. You can't always control what happens, but you're in charge of how you process it, Yeah. right? So yeah. remember, the yeah. moment in front of you is not bothering you. You're bothering yourself about the moment in front of you. And it's the same thing with the weather and the heat and the rain or, or anything. anything. It's just something that happens. What are you doing about it? it isn't it beautiful to know you're in complete control? Yeah. It's really no, up absolutely. to you. Right? I know. That's why I'm saying, I'm saying your book is very empowering because on the one hand, yes, you realize all the problems you created it. And the second is that then you are the person who can remove it. That's you don't right. need to rely on some God to come down that's, to descend that's right. you know, into my living room to that's, help me. That's right. And also how you do it, how fast you do it is also up to you. Like that's everything right. is actually, you know, of course this you is the, is the you in the back. That's right. Yeah. Um, so let's switch the gear a little bit, little bit to talk about success. Okay, I think people probably didn't know uh, that much about, because you're well known, especially for my readers, for those books. But you were actually a very successful, um, you built a company yourself. Actually, this room we're sitting in is your original office. Mm. You started with three people and turned to um, a billion dollar company, basically, in 1997, 7, we 8. public in 97. You went to right? public in 97. So, you know, a billion dollar now, then is a lot of money now. Mm. And you're very successful. And then you built, of course, there's, I think then there's, up and downs after that, which you um, led to the first book you had. Um, you also talked about your, like, you know, your friends actually became quite successful as well. So they actually all had a very successful life in the sort of popular um, view. Um, I think this is bothering a lot of people. Now, I mean, not success, but how to attain success. And you actually have a quote, I think, in the first book. You talk about 
basically is I should have that one. But basically, you're saying, if I remember it correctly, is saying everybody can be hugely successful, and what's blocking you is your own fear. Is your own fear inside that's blocking? I forgot where I should find that Sorry. quote. But the yeah, so I wonder how I think success is also becoming a a bit of a sort of a something that ignite anxiety too, because oh, sure. people associate not just with happiness, with achievement, but with something that somebody has. I don't. Um, what would be your, some uh, some of your advices on people who are trying to be successful? No. <laughs> I always answer everything at the deepest level of my understanding. I don't water it down or sit there and say they're not ready for this or something, right? So, and also all my experiences support what I'm sharing, right? First, you define what do you mean by success? And I go through that in the new book, yep. Living Untethered, yes. okay? You sit there and somebody will say, well, it means I can have the house that I always wanted. I have, a, I have a bucket list. My bucket list will come there. I have a relationship that's very fulfilling and that, that a relationship where somebody really loves me and dotes over me and has plenty of money so I don't have to worry about anything. And they just define all this stuff, right? And what I do in the new book is sit there and say, fine, okay, God blesses you. You can have all that. But who says that this person that was treating you really nice keeps treating you nice? What would you like if they start you know, abusing you and talking mean to you and so on? Well, what happens if you get the house and you don't like it? You didn't like the color of this, you didn't like that, and, and this and that, and you got all kinds of money, but now you don't know what to do with it, and people are grabbing at you, right? Did you really mean that's what you want? And you would say, no, no. Then in reality, what you meant was, I want what makes me feel good inside. That's what I want. It's an inner experience. I want the inner experience of feeling love all the time. Not I want someone who loves me that might behave in a way that I don't like, right? Or a house that somebody else thinks is neat, but I don't really like it. I say I do. I'm putting, in other words, you want the inner experience of well being. That's what it boils down to, very short. I want to feel good. I want to feel high. I want to wake up in the morning and be enthused to have woken up and not be worried about anything and sit there and say, I can't wait to go to work. I can't wait to come home and take care of the kids. I can't wait to take the son to soccer. I, I can't wait to do these things. I'm enthused. I'm excited. That's what you really want, isn't it? Who cares how you get it, right? What you want is to experience love, high beauty, inspiration, joy, right inside. Well, why don't you ask for that? that? That to me is what success is. Success is not the thing that you think will make that happen. Success is that itself. And that's the difference. Yeah. And so when people ask me, what does it mean to be successful? It means you're so high you can't even see straight. With no <laughs> drugs, all right? You just have you have internal drugs. That's <laughs> right. You're having a beautiful experience all the time. You can handle well, success. If you're successful, you can handle life. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not successful because you're, you're failing at, at being yeah. able to handle life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But people, people don't define success that way. Right. I mean, that's the problem indeed, because the bucket list, that's something I was doing, you know, with my community as well. I was saying, if you have a wish list, the problem is everybody have a similar one, frankly. You know, I have a lot of money, you know, I have property, right. I have health, I have love. Yep. But the problem with that list is that the most times in your life, you're not getting there, right. right? So like then the sense is that I have a sense of inadequacy there. So like I'm not good enough. Like only when I get this, I'll be good. That's that means right. most of your life, 99.99% oh, of it, that's right. you, you, you're not there. And then so basically it's a life of pain, right? Because people don't see it that way. They, they think, okay, they, and also the other, I think, reason why it's so hard is that People have projected their view to other people. They would have said, okay, see, Michael Singer has it, right? So he has everything. So if he can have it, why can't I have it? But what they see of you is only an outcome of many things and only aspects of it. They only saw your book. They didn't see all the hard work you did, all the failures, all the up and downs. They kind of take pictures of like snippets of other people's life and kind of stitch into a picture. That's right. And that's a concept, right? right. And saying, okay, see, somebody has it. That's why if I couldn't have it, that means it's my problem. Right. 
And then, yeah, but I think having this insight though, because there, there's also, we go talk to the voice, because I heard this question so often saying that once I have that, I will be okay. <laughs> well, that's, I would be ready for you to say that. They sit there and say, the reason I'm not okay is because I don't, have, I don't have that. Right. Versus <laughs> I'm not okay to start with, and I made up that that would make me be okay. That's very, very different. Yes. Right? I use yeah. the example in the book yes. that if you eat food that makes you sick, and you have a stomach ache, and you're looking for Pepto-Bismol. You know what Pepto-Bismol is in China? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you're looking for Pepto-Bismol, and you can't find it. I can't find the Pepto-Bismol. Bismol, yeah. And somebody comes in and says, what's the matter? What's bothering you? And Stop. you say, I can't find Fine. the Pepto-Bismol. No, that's not what's bothering you. What's bothering you is the stomach ache. What's bothering you is that you ate the wrong thing, <laughs> right? So don't sit there and say that which you thought would fix, compensate, for what's bothering you. The problem is you create what, yourself. The fact that you can't find it, that's not what's bothering you. Yeah. You have to come down to the root. Right. And so ultimately success is that you feel complete, whole within yourself. Yeah. I call it self-effulgent. That's a nice word. Right. Self-effulgent. <laughs> that the shining is happening inside. It's whole. It's complete. Yeah. Right. And now the question becomes if that's what success is, and it is. Yeah. Okay. There are plenty of people. Look, back in the 20s, what was it, 28, 29, when the Wall Street crash, yeah, right? Yeah, 29, These yeah. famous, they have pictures of these famous rich people jumping out of the, their pictures of them falling out of Wall Street's buildings. You better look at that, right? <laughs> it's like, if that's success, I quit, okay? That's not success. They were not successful. They couldn't handle anything. Yeah. So success is to find this inside, and now the question becomes, how do you do that? In my success... I don't count any of these outside things as success. That I always focused on this voice inside my head is causing trouble. It's blocking me. My own blockages are blocking me. So success is letting go of the tethers, letting go of what's blocking you. Yep. Then you can interact with the world. You, you do interact with the world, yep. right? And everybody thinks you're successful. <laughs> they look, because of course you're going to attract success. Of course people want to work with you. Of course you have great inspiration because you cleansed out all these you're blockages, so. yeah. right? Yeah. And so, but that's what causes success. Yeah. Now you're a successful person. How, you how do you be successful in a relationship? You know what people do? I need to find somebody that fulfills what's wrong with, <laughs> with me. me. <laughs> I'm blocking myself. I don't feel worthy of love. Now you come and show me that I do. I'm <laughs> closing myself down. I'm causing myself trouble. You come and fix that. No, that's not how it works. It can't yeah. happen, yeah. right? Yeah. So a successful relationship is first cleanse what's inside of you yeah. that doesn't let you feel the love and the inspiration and the beauty and fulfillment. Yeah. Now share it. Yeah. That's a good relationship. Right. That relationship, if you get two people having that, yeah. right? My job is to cleanse me so that there's love I can share with you. Not you have to make me you feel failed. love. Oh, we're getting divorced. As you talk about your uh, energy, actually in the new book, Living Untethered, there's an entire chapter on dealing with blocked energies. Um, and then also you you have <laughs> I like it because you know, we talk about mid age crisis. You said a, mid a, mid a midlife crisis happens when you've been building and cleaning and fighting for half of your life in order to be okay, and you're not. And then, and then you talk about how the um, the um, um, and you basically exactly said that you, you said the spiritual path is always about letting go of yourself, and that means dealing with the blocked energies. Um, how you also use this word called transmutation, transmutation, and then so so sort of how do you use the kind of access the higher state of energy um i guess the removing blockage do you also see this as different stages because you know because you can see the whole thing is about letting go the letting go and energy and then you remove blocks um does that mean transmutation will happen anytime or transmutation is that something you mean even you because you also have this i remember this example where you say if you feel love for somebody that comes out of your heart chakra but you're actually not take into the full potential because if you do you actually go straight through you your two up. other chakras mm -hmm. up there yeah so how how do we understand this concept of energy are there different levels of energy we access at different like you know we open different gates doors. or or doors or this is a once for all type of thing like how does it work like if you think of energy as a physics term <laughs> As always, it's not as complicated as we make it. Mm. You are a being of energy. There's tremendous, and, and I'm talking to everybody, 
You're a being of energy, okay? And that energy naturally, just like tree sap, naturally goes up, right? It's, there's a natural flow to your energy. It's just part of your being, mm -hmm. right? So there's all this energy. In yoga, we call it, we call it shakti. Shakti, uh, yeah. In, in the far east, it's called chi, right? Yeah. And there's different aspects of it, but basically, this energy is always trying to come up. That's its natural state, just like your heart always beats and your breath always goes in. You don't have to do anything. That's why I really want to pray. You don't have to do anything. It's a natural, natural. That's that's what the Bible in Genesis talks about being in the garden. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to do anything. They're in the garden, right? It says you're in the state of bliss, of total openness, wonderful being. All right, okay. Why is that energy? Why don't I experience that energy? People don't know anything about the energy. You understand that? Why don't I experience it? Because you've blocked it. We've been through that. How did I block it? You pushed away experiences that you couldn't handle and you collected them inside of you as suppressed or repressed or just resisted stuff. And now they, they're down there and they're blocking your energy. Well, is the energy trying to still come back up? Then that stuff still come back up in your dreams and your thoughts. It's trying to cleanse itself. The energy is trying, the heart always tries to be healthy. You're, you have an immune system. Your body is amazing what it tries to be healthy. Your energy system is always trying to flow up. It's trying to feed you. It's whole, complete, right? That's why it's trying to push that stuff out of the way. That's why it keeps coming back up, right? Okay. So what does it mean for transmutation? What does it mean for energy to raise to the different centers? It means to cleanse those blockages. Can people do intense practices that, you know, for years long, intense things to force the energy to find a channel to where they can have some? Yes, they can do that, but it won't stay. You understand that? Because the energy is still blocked. The blockage is still there, mm -hmm. right? But you can have experiences. They do all kinds of intense, real intense practices. The Zen is intense, right? It's real intense stuff, right? Or more natural is what I said. If you remove the blockages, the energy will fill every crevice. It's trying to come up. It's like water. It tries to find a way up, all right? Every blockage you remove, it will try to push its way through. Okay, so the more you release your blockages, the more you let go, okay, the more the energy will come up. Mm -hmm. But that's not always a strong good thing because it'll push the next thing up that bothers you. Mm -hmm. And so you think this is mm -hmm. not working. Mm -hmm. It is working. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to do that, it will by itself naturally work its way through the different centers. Every center works through, it is like a transformer. Yep. It becomes stronger. You have people who have no idea how strong energy flow can be, all right? So at first, it's cold, it's dark down there, and I don't want to go down there. You start letting go, it starts coming up. You start saying, well, this is working. I, this is nice, okay? And then basically, you start feeling more love. Maybe you fall in love more naturally because you're not as blocked, all right? But if you go out there and say, oh, now I feel some love, I want to grab somebody and hold on to them and keep them, you, you, in a sense, that's fine. You'll work your way through that. But instead of letting the energy go higher and keep letting go of the blockages, like I said that, it's not that you don't have relationships. It's that you don't grab and cling and try to pull somebody else's into you to compensate for the blockages you, you have, have. Yeah. right? So you keep letting go in the middle of a relationship. And you better, because relationships are difficult to have because they hit your stuff, <laughs> okay? And so it's wonderful. And so you keep going up, you keep going up, and you'll find out that as the energy finds its way up, you feel higher, you feel lighter, you're more positive because you have energy inside. You feel strength. Yeah. That gives you the strength to go to the next level yeah. and the next level. Transmutation is you start to feel an energy. It's flowing. Then somebody says something or doesn't say something, and it hits your stuff, and you start to close, right? You start feeling anger or jealousy or insecurity, right? But you're conscious enough now to look at that and say, I don't want to exchange the beautiful energy I was feeling for this yiki energy that because it's, I'm still blocked. And you look at it and you, my whole path is you relax. Relax around the blockage. Therefore, it can release. 
So it's coming up. I feel some anger. Why did he do that? Why didn't he take care of me? How do you forget my anniversary? How dare he? <laughs> right? And this stuff comes up very personal, very junky stuff. Okay. You know, when my father forgot my mother's anniversary, she almost left him. I can't tolerate this. <laughs> right? Those are your experiences. And so it starts to come up. It hits that stuff. You relax. Just look at it. I don't want to go there. I don't push it away, but I don't need to go there. Let's get this over with, right? And sometimes you'll feel it starts as anger, and then you release it, and it comes up as love. That's transmutation. You release the blocked energy. The energy was going to express itself at that level. It's the same energy. By the way, anger is that energy expressing itself when it hits a blockage, mm. and you feel it shooting out. Mm -hmm. Okay, Love is that energy when you really love somebody so much that your heart goes out to them, yeah. right? That is the same. It's all the same energy. It's your energy flow, your core energy flow. And so the more you release the blockages, the higher it comes up. Eventually, it gets so strong, and these aren't just words, it's an experience, that you feel it like, well, the Bible says, rush of holy waters, all right? You feel this rush coming up inside of you, win always. And it comes up, and it comes to the point between your eyebrows, it will naturally flow up there, what they call the third eye, the sixth chakra, and it just flows up there, win always. Day, night, sleep, awake, everything. It's always flowing up there. What are you doing to make it? Nothing. Nothing. You just it's, allow it's, it to go. It's, it's natural flow. It's natural flow is up. Okay? And so this whole process, you don't have to worry about the energy. The energy will take care of you. Just like you don't worry about your immune system normally. Yeah, right? It's working. It, it, it's amazing. It works. <laughs> it's free of charge. There's a battle going on in there. <laughs> yeah, right? White constantly. blood cells, white, <laughs> white cells, et cetera, et cetera. The energy, your energy is way more intelligent than that. This yeah. core energy is the source of all brilliance, the source of all light, yeah. and it will work its way through if you get out of the way. Yeah. <clears throat> That's called letting go, surrendering, releasing, relaxing. Yeah. Okay. It will go and do that. So there, I think yeah. I answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Beautifully. I think, you know, with the, um, the next topic I want to go a bit deeper with you around is this connecting this internal experience to the external world. Yes. Because this, this, what do you, you, you know, you, I, I was just, just joyful even listening to you describe because this, this is the state of bliss, right? But there is a misconception. People say, okay, this is all about you. This is happening in your, like in your little room, in your woods, when you're walking. Um, if I'm concerned with social injustice, okay, I'm concerned with all the bad things that happen out in the world. Why would that be helpful? It's okay. That, that's a very beautiful question. It's very deep. So at first, you're a mess. <laughs> and you say you're concerned. You're concerned because it causes you to feel bad. It causes you to feel they took my power away. It causes me to feel this is wrong. This is, you know, my mother let my father treat him like that. And I'm never going to put up that kind of thing. I'm going to assert myself and affirm myself, right? And because you've got blockages, you've got stuff in there. It's because you're in trouble that this becomes a way, you know, in, People blow up buildings as a protest or something like that. In other words, I need to find a way to release this terrible energy that I'm feeling inside that got stimulated and, in a sense, justified because of what's happening outside. Do you understand that? That's a very deep concept, right? So it's not really a philosophy. It's that I got this, this energy could come out, come out one way or another, right? Now it's coming out because you said this or you did this or the government did that. And so, no, that's unacceptable. And so all this junk needs to express itself. I, I don't call that activism. It may look like activism, but it's really very, very personal, right? You're just finding a way to release your junk, okay? You're saying that, okay. Now, what happens if you work with yourself? You work with yourself, you start feeling love. You start feeling joy. You start feeling bliss. You start feeling high. You start feeling clarity. And then the question becomes, well, if you feel all that, why would you bother coming out here? Because love loves to express itself. And inspiration loves to create. It's a natural process, but you're doing it out of the energy flow, not the lack of energy flow. And so you're going to find some that, that real activists like Martin Luther King or Gandhi or some of these people, they didn't feel hatred. That wasn't what was driving them, right? They had a connection to something higher inside and it was expressing itself. So real activism, it's called conscious activism. You're a conscious activist. You're conscious, you're aware, and there are things going on outside that you can help. So you're coming out to help, not to complain. 
You're not yelling and blowing things up and doing everything. You're coming out here saying, is there some way that I can help this child, help the school, help this business, help this government, help anything? Is there anything that's flowing in front of me that I can raise with the beautiful energy, the beautiful love, the beautiful clarity and inspiration that I have going on inside of me. I once said, and people really like it, so I say it a lot of times now, the highest life you can live is when every moment that passes before you is better off because it did. Because of you, yeah. yeah because it's better off because well, it passed, passed by you. you because you raised it. Yeah. That is activism. So wow. it's not that you're not active. Okay, you're and actually very active. You're you're extremely <laughs> active, but you're coming from a place of high, a place of beauty, a place of power, not from a place of complaint and negativity and throwing darkness out there into yeah. the world. Yeah, one one picture I have in my mind is that people get triggered by the darkness, and then if, as you said, if you have a lot of junk inside, your instinct is to fight the darkness with the darker stuff. That's right. <laughs> Right. So if you are doing bad things, I, you're, you know, I'm going to do that with the darker stuff rather than as you described is basically you bring the light, right. you bring the light. And then, and then when you bring the light, you find out the darkness isn't a physical thing anyway. It's just a absence lack of light. Absence, absence of, light. of light. Yeah. So like once you're there, like even a candlelight, yes. it doesn't have to be super bright, but like even like a candlelight, then there's the, the entire darkness is gone. But that's, yeah, exactly. So that's why I think, thank you for answering that so beautifully because I get this question a lot too. Like, you know, why are you meditating? Like, why, why are you not out there on the street? <laughs> but actually, you're probably not, on, not out there on the street, but you're actually very, very active engaging with the world in a deeper level. Yeah. Is that how you feel? Because, you know, people put, you know, like especially this place, right? It's very, feels very sacred. There's a temple. People come in. It's, you know, in the middle of the woods and, and all that. Um, how do you see your life now interacting with the world? Like this is a secluded place or this is out there? Like how, or I make that, that's a binary talking I know right there, but how do you integrate your life now? Cause you do a lot of things now. You're very active. I know that, but you're also very active inside that little room. Right. <laughs> no, I, I, I have found that if I work on myself and keep letting go of the stuff that's causing the bad energies inside, if I will work on that, that life unfolds in front of me and it gives me things to do. They don't have to be big things. It's like, like my God, somebody thinks I'm not doing any good unless I'm working with the president of this country and you know, doing that kind of thing, right? Right, just whatever it is that comes before me, maybe it's I do a lot of computer stuff. I'm a computer guy, right? So around here, somebody's modem breaks. I'll re help fix it or replace it. You just do what's in front of you. That's all I've done. And now I look back and I notice, well, the Untethered Soul has sold over 3 million copies and all these people's lives are being touched. Do I feel any ownership to that? Of course not. I didn't decide to write the book. I didn't decide to go through the life experiences that taught me what I learned, right? There was a time to write the book. It came. Karen right, was available. They came together and we worked on this book, right? And then the next book happened, the next book. And all these things are going out there. And then Oprah, beautiful Oprah, is a very, very special lady. She loved the book yeah. and she became the PR person. Yeah. She went out there and promoted the book to yeah. everybody. Yeah. And all these things happened to me. All right. And I serve them as they happen. Mm -hmm. And so you ask me, how are you helping the world? I don't know that I'm helping the world, but somehow it got helped. Right? <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's, it's consciousness expressing itself it, it, through you. It is. Things and the happen. work you do. Somebody yeah. once said to me, really back in the, it was early, back in the <laughs> early days, said, I want to thank you. You helped me so much. And, and in those days, I didn't know how to take that. All right. I said, I didn't help you. I didn't do anything. All right. And this was back in the seventies. And basically they, they argued with me. They said, no, my God, I came to your teaching. You gave a talk and it really changed how I looked at things and it completely changed my life. Right. And I sat there and said, I, I, I didn't do anything. I don't even know you. All right. I didn't do it. <laughs> and so they finally said to me, right, you got out of the way so it could happen. I said, okay, that I understand. Yes. I got out of the way so that that helped you happen. Right. And that's how 
a, a being looks at things. They yeah. don't, it's not an ego thing. It's not yeah. what did I do. Yeah. But my experience is if you will let go of yourself, let go of the darkness, let go of the stuff that makes it so personal, yeah. something greater happens. That's yeah. all. It's just the nature of yeah. this, the Tao. Yeah. Right? You're not playing at the extremes and fighting with things. Yeah. Then there's this power that unfolds in the middle and you don't own it. You have nothing to do with it. Right. But you look and you see what it happened. Yeah. Yeah. One thing, um, if we look forward a little bit, let's look at our children. Because once when I was reading all three of your books, frankly, because when I first read your book, um, I already have three kids. And then they're back then, they're all under five years old. So this question constantly in my mind, I was like, you, you talk about blockage, you talk how we build up things. And we know about karma, like things kind of get on generation to generation. Um, how does this help us to be better parents? Because I think a lot of parents read your book would say, hey, you know, if I knew better, you know, how do I, like, if, if I have a newborn baby in front of me, okay, does he or she have to go through the same process of building, you know, layers and layers blockage blockages, and then at a certain time, maybe 20, 30 or maybe 40 something year old, I realize this is bullshit. Okay, this is wrong. I'm going to, you know, remove them. Um, can this process be different if we are more conscious when we, you know, be either by parents or be teachers or in schools, in thinking about, you know, those nascent beings yes the answer is of course it could be different but not the way that people want to think mm. okay when you're a parent a new soul a child has been put in your care yeah who is bringing up that child i've heard parents say i gave you the best years of my life and now look what you're doing right i had a career and i gave up my like oh is that what's bringing up your child that will have a very strong impact and influence, right? You, you need to go to soccer. You want to do this. You want to do that. Come on. You're driving me crazy. Right? Okay. In other words, you leave your impressions on your child. Mm -hmm. It's basic psychology. You leave your impression on your child. What can you do to make it so that the child can grow more spiritually, more open? You can be more spiritual. You can be more open. All right? The cleaner you are as a parent the less stuff you're dumping onto your kid. It's not a matter of reading this book or how to parent. How, okay, do it if you need to do that. This is how you parent, right? You <laughs> let go of yourself. Yeah. It's not about you, yeah. right? It ceases to be about you. You yeah. have to be selfless. You yeah. let go of yourself truly, right? And you serve to the best of your ability. So the child needs his diaper changed. You change the diaper. Not, I hate this. Why do I have to do this? I never wanted to do this. Right? Those energies come across to the child. Mm. Right? So mm. the more you let go of yourself, the more the child is not taking on the impressions that you're leaving. That's a major set of impressions. Okay? And the child can grow up open, willing, trusting, et cetera. All right. And then some, some parents say, no, you need to be tough. You know, I need to have a tough childhood so you're able to handle the world. The world's a tough place. It's called grit. No. All right. All right. No. Resilience. The truth of the matter is, if you're filled with energy and you're filled with love and you're filled with inspiration, now you can handle the world. Exactly. You can handle the people who are like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Why? Because it's not hitting your stuff. Why? You don't have as much stuff. Yeah. So I once said to somebody, who said, literally, people have come to me and said, I don't want to have children because I know I'll screw them up. Okay? And, that, and, and, and it's terrible, right? And the answer is, then get out of the way. All right? <laughs> don't you be the parent. Let God be the parent. Let an energy higher than you come through and serve selflessly and see how that child grows up. That doesn't mean it's a hippie child that can just do whatever they want and run around wild and be crazy. No, you have a discipline, right? But it's not because, it's not true that children should be seen and not heard, okay? That's because you don't want to be disturbed by them, right? <laughs> but it is also true that a child has to respect that people are talking, right? So it's not, you don't do it out of your personal self. You do it out of bringing up the child, what's love for the child, what's honorable, dharmic, yeah. Right? And people don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. It was interesting. One of the questions I got, similar, like, because we don't have school, because we're saying, talking about trusting, like, like we're saying, like, you have to have an environment and, you know, trust them and see them. And I get this question a lot, saying that, you know, this world out there is so competitive. Like, if you have all this soft, like, stuff, like, how can they be tough? One of the analogies I used is like, you know, similar to what you're saying. I was like, you know, let's say if the out, if, if um, the world out there has a lot of little knives and cut your skin, okay? 
And then how do you prepare your kids for that life? Um, you could either cut, start cutting yourself at home already. So like they get used to being cut or you raise them healthy, right? So they have a good immune system and they can recover. What would you choose? That's beautiful. Right? But like people would say like, why would you start cutting yourself right. at home and then start up? Right. So people sort of get it, but that's so true. It's the impression. Cause I think what you said is very powerful is that it's actually very subtle things. It doesn't have to be what school I send them to or what book or what toy I bought. It's like how you are when you're doing that diaper change, right. right? And you think the diaper, the, the baby doesn't understand it, but they actually- They the, pick up your they vibration. Up, exactly, it's so, the vibration, it's the field. Right. It there all in. ends up being the same. That's what's so beautiful. Everything's the same. Let go of yourself. Let go of yourself. This thing you call yourself, your preferences, your desires, your needs, your bucket list, and so on, is just a projection of the stuff you stored inside. Well, what do you mean? If you didn't have it, you'd be filled with love and filled with light. You wouldn't be asking any questions. You'd love having a child. You'd love bringing it up. You'd enjoy every moment of it. If you homeschool, you don't homeschool. It doesn't make any difference. Doesn't Everything, because you're fine. And that's the environment they grow up in. How should I grow up in an environment yeah. where it's just pure love and openness and understanding? If they have a problem, they bring it to you. You don't think, oh my God, what did I do? What's it? You just, you have clarity. You can share with them and help them come to the solution themselves right yeah so it's a healthy thing because you're healthy so a parent shouldn't sit there and say it's so hard to bring up a child it's hard because you didn't bring yourself up, up. <laughs> you didn't let go of your own stuff right yeah and so it's it's there's so many things to learn yeah it's all about you evolving as a being as a being of light as a being of energy and keep bringing yourself up and letting go then you spread that light everywhere mm -hmm. and it takes care of business somebody wanted me to because i did business i don't have business can you give a spiritual talk on business right i generally will say no right? <laughs> i i don't want to focus on, like like that right but the truth is i would give the exact same, same talk, talk right how do you run a successful business let go of yourself then you're not making decisions based on your garbage and your fears and your past experiences and all that kind of junk. Yeah. You're bringing good energy into it and it will attract good energy and people around you will work with good energy and they'll enjoy working with you. Yeah. My company, we're technical, high tech, very few people ever left. They yeah. loved working there, yeah. right? And I didn't pay them the top salaries either because we're out here in the middle of the woods, right? <laughs> and basically, you just create an environment for business, an environment for children, an environment for love, an environment for everything you do that brings beauty and love and clarity and selflessness, true selflessness, into your environment. It will change everything. Yeah. Imagine if everybody lived like that. There I wouldn't know. be any wars. <laughs> They wouldn't, it's not like, how do I stop the war? Well, then let, it won't happen right away. <laughs> It'll take a long time, right? <laughs> but basically, if people will let go of their garbage, they won't bring garbage into the world. They'll yeah. bring love and light into the world. Yeah, yeah. So beautiful. Okay, my last question, last one, is exactly to your, to your point. Because if you look at today's world, um, if you're you know, somebody with conscience, you would feel frustrated. Well, if you have garbage inside, I guess. You, know, you see wars, you see conflicts. Um, and I wonder if you actually answered me when we were talking, but I think it would be great to share with everybody, is that if you look at the, the it's always very few people, or a like few beings that are enlightened. If you look at human history, right? So like, you, you know, like there's always people who pop up, but seems to be very few and far between. Um, if you look at the history, do you think we have now this age we're living in, is the percentage of enlightened beings higher or lower or no change over the years? Like, are we getting better as a human being, as a race, in attaining that higher level of consciousness? Yes. I don't think there's any question about it, okay? Like, we all go through experiences, and some of us are knocked down by the experiences, and some of us are raised up, right? Learn to, to grow from that, right? And the evolution of the human race is there are more positive things going on. There's less poverty in the world than there was before. There's more opportunity. As terrible as it is, you understand that? There's less than there was before. True. There's more of a middle class, yes. both in China and in different places, right? And this gives people opportunities they didn't have before, 
It's so easy to be negative about things, okay? But the truth is, if you look, it was worse, all right? There was less resources, there was less, this was more dictatorships, really more than it was, right? You know, kings and queens and all that kind of stuff. And so now it has risen up. And as things rise up, it all rises. And there are more higher beings and more clarity. Okay, like so much knowledge and spirituality was in India, and also in ancient China, yeah. okay? You know, the Taoists and, and, and so on, yeah. uh, much of Confucius' teachings. Yes. And But certainly in India, that was the whole thing, the gurus and all that kind of stuff. This That's not spread all over the world. Yoga's all over the world, right? It isn't sitting there on one... In the caves. On that side, in the caves, up in yeah. the mountains, okay? Yeah. It's been spread. So the answer is yes. Human, the whole race evolves. Everything evolves, okay? It doesn't look good. It's messy, Okay, because you have to go through the stuff, yeah. right? But as a whole, it has evolved, it is higher, and it and it is doing. I mean, look, as, as many problems the United States has with their politics and all that kind of junk, right? It's a democracy, yeah, right? There didn't used to be that kind. It was an yeah. experiment yes. back in seventeen seventy six. They, they, they called it an experiment. How right. do you like that? Right? Yeah. I call this the surrender experiment. experiment. <laughs> that was an experiment. What if people governed themselves? Is it perfect? No, no way in a million years, all right? Because <laughs> people are not perfect. But is it an amazing experiment yeah. that we could sit there and let people actually vote and 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 I let know. that change? And can it go wrong if they vote the wrong person? Yes, all kinds of things can happen. But the foundation underneath is let's try an experiment where all men are I make you cry. Yeah, all I men know, are created, created equal, equal, right? And they have the right to pursue happiness. Yeah. Let's try to create that. They were trying to create that before they were sitting there saying i'm the king you do what i tell you right so it's a very great thing i know and you should be positive I, about it right <laughs> no it touches me because i actually just came back from philadelphia i was reading all the all the work so they actually wrote um a couple times to to the parliament in the uk and almost begging so it's that's why in history teaches us a lot it's not like even the experiment they're not confident yes. they were actually very very like oh, i mean yeah. touchy feely the founding, founding fathers right father, 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 father. exactly and then the first the the, the, the first the first letter they wrote is almost like a shame if you look at now. Like, can we please? Yes, like, yes. if you don't consider, that's <laughs> fine. Yeah, yeah. I know, and I, I, I feel it. And, then, and now look at what has created, yeah. right? So it's over 250 years and all that and became an inspiration for many freedom-loving people around yes, the world yes. despite all its problems. Yes, that's the key. You can focus on the problems you can focus on the darkness. You can focus on the light. Yes. Because my you know, Yogananda once said, right? Don't tell me what you're doing wrong. Tell me what you're doing right, because the light will dispel the darkness. So if you're aimed in the right direction and you're really sincerely trying, of course you're going to fall. Of course you're going to be things, right? Just keep focusing on your pole star, on that which is taking you higher. The rest will come along, all right? It's called evolution. You're evolving. Right. Okay. Well, I think that's that's the beautiful ending to our conversation. Thank that's, you so much. Oh, thank you. It's an honor <laughs> to talk to you. So wonderful. Okay, I think we're done. Maybe we'll show you the video. You can still keep the camera on. So it says, thank you for an amazing story. We're here joining you to surrender in the flow, to the flow of life. Hi, Miki. I'm Bai Bai. In the Noyen Society, many people are reading your books. I really like you. 受你的影响，我专门建立了一个小组来进行沉浮。得知一诺可以带着我们沉浮实验小组收集的对你表达喜爱和感谢的视频去见你，我内心激动不已。This book opened a new door in my mind. Oh, it is possible to achieve a successful life, a peaceful mind, with less energy wasted. This is my daughter. She is just seven months old. I read your book again when I was pregnant, so I believe she will be she will be a huge fan of yours in the future. I was lost totally. I have to say, your books helped me. Thank you. I want to tell you that your books, uh, Surrender Experiments and A Tested Soul, are very very popular in our community. It indeed opens a. Entirely new world of inner peace. You know what? I was deeply attracted by the strong flow of life. I wish I could be that bear one day. It's an amazing and intriguing book. 
which has been changing me in subtle and profound ways. You and your stories make me believe in the power of life and the power within ourselves. I have recommended the two books to many of my friends, and we also plan to organize a seminar about the two books in August. It is incredible that I could got a chance to talk to you. Your book has enlightened me and many other people. Surrender has become a hot word among us. But reading your book made me feel peaceful and、uh, a mind-changing journey, because I got to know that life will unfold in its own way and it will go quite well without my control. Because you let us know. Life would be like this, and I wish I can visit you someday, and I'm sure I will visit you someday. Thank you. These two books really changed me a lot. They made me to face pain, to accept myself, to accept my life. I have deeply believed and relied on the judgment of my head. Surrender undoubtedly opened a new window of my life. It is so interesting that the group named the Surrender Experiment in China is born to live this principle out, and I feel honored to be a member of it. Your experience in leading meditation in prison really shocked me. 与一群伙伴一起，一起践行沉浮，一起冥想，一起读书。我有点不敢相信。居然有这样可以跨时空的被看见的机会！我非常喜欢他们，他们是我生命当中很神奇的礼物。每次阅读你的书，都有一种特别放松、特别享受的感觉。这本书是我看过的最棒的心灵启迪书。当我第一次听到“沉浮实验”这个词的时候，还是很困惑的，期待有。更多的交流机会，我发现在中国古老的医书《黄帝内经》中，也同样阐释了这样的道理。我们中国人叫顺其自然。And、uh, I hope one day I have the chance to go to your meditation house and、uh, meet you. 谢谢你的沉浮实验，让我重新认识了我的过往。觉得这本书是一本值得一生反复练习和不断修为练习的好书。我和开智的相遇相知，也是一次沉浮于生命之流的旅程。我们相识于诺言社区，一同经历过很多神奇的故事后，终于走在一起。我想到了《道德经》里面“无为而治，无为而无不为”的状态，还有王阳明先生的“至诚如神”的感觉。他给了我很大的触动，我也决定呢，在自己日常生活中呢，也践行沉浮实验。读了之后，就会觉得太神奇了，太不可思议了。我呢有一个愿望，就是希望在呃某一天，中国的某一个地方，我也能够建立一个像林中小屋这样的场所。周围有很多小伙伴都超爱这本书和冥想。Look here， 这是我用图画对书的解读。它帮我开启了自我探索之旅，可以让我慢慢的去了解生命的神奇和伟大。他曾极大的缓解了我作为一个新手妈妈的焦虑与不安，同时，因为有你的经历作为参照，让我确信2019年底的新工作邀约是生命向我发出的信号。感恩您的沉浮实验和不羁的灵魂，把我从生命低谷当中拖拽出来，让我能够每一天都更加欣赏自己在这神奇宇宙当中的生命。Mickey。Thank you for your amazing story. We are here, joining you in surrounding to floor of the life. Oh, <laughs> wow! It's just beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and then that scene that I put in the little,、uh, a little USB、oh, drive. Yeah, so you can、yeah. have it and then copy it. <laughs> All right. Well. Maybe you want to say a few words to the people who made the video. I guess they will be happy to hear from you. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for making that beautiful video. It just moved me so deeply <laughs> to see that you all can grow that much, and in the environment you're in, with the different things that happen politically in all the different worlds and different countries, you rise above that. 
and you just make something very beautiful of your life. You know, life is so short. You're born and then you die, right? Now you understand that you can make every experience a beautiful experience and then it spreads to everybody. What you all are doing is raising everything. They say the great saints in the Himalayas sit there and meditate 24 hours a day and they're giving off this field of energy that's helping everybody. That's what you're doing. When you raise yourself like this, you're helping your whole community, you're helping your family, you're helping the whole world. So I really honor and respect, and I love, I love the video that you made, so I got to meet you all. And someday I will get to meet you. Come visit me. Namaste. <laughs>